Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm Nancy Berteau, Professor of Economics and Faculty Co-Chair of Xavier's Sustainability Committee. And this is Xavier's eighth annual Campus Sustainability Day celebration. Similar activities are happening this month at campuses all over the country. Check the website of AISHI, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. On behalf of my co-chair on Sustainability Committee, John Schulte, who's right here, okay, um, and the student sustainability interns, who I'd like to introduce, Laura Castillo, there, wave, wave, there you go, and Charlie Gonzalez, where are you? There you go. Um, and all other members of Xavier's Sustainability Committee, could you guys wave the other members of Sustainability? How about past members of Sustainability Committee? Why don't you wave? Yeah, we got a lot of them, okay? And David, I know you're one of them too, yeah. Um, we welcome you. Uh, Xavier's Sustainability Committee represents a cross-section of the campus community working to reduce energy use and transportation costs, increase green space, steward water and organic materials, and make our purchasing and maintenance practices more sustainable. The committee was created in 2008 when President Michael Graham signed the American College and University Presence Climate Commitment which we used to know as ACUPUC, and has now been relabeled the Climate Commitment, and the network has now been renamed Second Nature, which is a lot easier to say. Uh, committee members are currently in the process of updating our greenhouse gas report and our overall progress report. These should be finished by the end of the semester, and the committee is working extremely hard, meeting almost every week to do this, so I really want to thank them for their efforts. Xavier has become a national leader since 2008 with our five academic sustainability programs, all of them interdisciplinary, experientially oriented, with a focus on environmental ethics. We now have 100 majors and minors and are supported by a sustainability advisory board that includes chief sustainability officers from Fifth Third Bank, P&G, Kroger, Macy's, and more. And by the way, um, I would like to just call attention to a number of faculty who are teaching very uh, heavily in the sustainability field. We have our professor of sustainability and global culture, Shuparna Chatterjee, in the back, if you want to wave Shuparna. There she is, yeah. And we also have a number of adjunct faculty who are teaching all kinds of creative, hands-on courses in the field. And a number of them are on our panel today. So Scott Burns, Larry Falcon, Roxanne Qualls, who am I missing? Um, these folks are, and uh, Len Sowers is right here, okay, are all teaching uh, they're all either advisory board members or key uh, partners to Xavier who are teaching really exciting courses um, that are open, not just to majors, but all kinds of students. If you're looking for an elective, there's some really neat stuff that you're really going to learn about what's happening out in the community. Uh, and by the way, a lot of these are one credit, five week night course. You can take one of them, two of them, three of them, because they run five weeks, five weeks, five weeks, and get exposed to some really interesting topics. Um, on the operations side, I think I can announce now, Bob Sheeran is not here, so he'll get mad at me, hopefully not, um, to say that, um, hopefully I'm not stealing anybody's thunder, to say that the planned health and recreation building um, that Xavier's going to be constructing, the idea is that we're going to be building it to the LEED gold standard, which would be our highest standard yet, and that will be coming up very shortly. There'll be a sustainability team supporting that design effort. So, thinking about what we're doing today, our 2015 theme was consumption justice, 2014 was water justice, 2013 was energy justice. For this year, our theme is climate justice, and we are going to focus today on how local sustainability efforts can contribute to climate justice. I will give a brief overview on climate change and climate justice. We'll then hear a few words from our new Dean of Arts and Sciences, David Menkel and a great sustainability advocate for many years. Followed by dialogue with a panel of experts which we'll bring up from government, business, as well as Xavier's own campus. All right, so just turning, and I hope I'm not insulting anybody, but I, but I was told, let's just get down to basics and say, you know, what, what is, what's climate change? Anyway, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So um, I'm going to start here by just saying, does anybody, and you really can answer this as like, 
you know, not know what the greenhouse effect is. Okay, so, you know, a little map of the greenhouse effect, how sunlight is converted into life-giving uh, properties for us. And so it's an essential thing. I mean, the greenhouse effect is like we would not be alive on the planet without the greenhouse effect. So, you know, we really need it. But what has happened is because of human introduction of very high levels of greenhouse gases, basically through our economy, and through our population growth, the, that, those combined two things, is that we've put a whole lot more greenhouse gases up there, which means more heat is trapped. And this is the basis of climate change. So it's a good thing, but it's too much of a good thing, basically. Um, here is some data um, on atmospheric CO2. It's a little out of date. It's 2010. It has us going to 391. The actual parts per million right now is exactly 400, okay, in 2016. So that's where we're at now. So if we go back to 1980, we can see this steady increase, and we go, oh, wow, that's, you know, from 306 to, you know, 400. Wow, that's, that's kind of significant. Let's back it up a bit. And let's look at, you know, zero, year zero, and see what was happening all the way until you get into the Industrial Revolution. And it shoots up, okay? So you get a little, you back up, you get a little bit more perspective. And then you often will hear the climate change deniers talk about, well, we've always had cycles up and down. This is nothing new, right? So let's go back to geologic time. Let's go way, way back. I don't know, these KYBCEs, are they thousands of years? I think that's what they are, right? And you, you do see cycles. Yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> they all top out in the two-something. And we're at 400 and rising. And no signs, no policies really in place to control that at this point, right? So that gets translated. And I like Bill McKibben's three numbers, if you've ever seen his, his three numbers um, video. You can look it up on YouTube. And as you know, that a, a tar you, as you probably know, a target of many people in terms of climate change is let's try to keep it under 2 degrees Celsius warming overall, average temperatures for the Earth. Now, the recent climate talks in Paris in December actually recognize that a much more reasonable goal would be like 1.5, okay? Uh, in fact, the island nations have the saying 1.5 to stay alive because they're gone at 2 degrees. So, but even accepting 2 degrees as a, you know, probably not ambitious enough target, what he does is he calculates how many gigatons of carbon we can burn and still stay under that. So there's a budget, okay? I'm an economist, I like budgets, right? So the budget is 565 billion tons, gigatons, right? That is a billion tons, right? Right, John, gigatons? I think it is, I think it's a billion tons. All right, well, that sounds like a lot, right? Okay, but if you do the math on what we're using now, guess how long that lasts? How many years? Just guess. At our current rates of usage, without increasing, which we're constantly increasing. How many years do you think? Hmm? 15. How old are you guys? At 15. You're not even going to be old. Okay? Okay? Now, here is the scariest number of all, according to Bill and me as an economist. This number, 2795. That is the number of gigatons of carbon assets on corporate balance sheets right now. So Exxon and Shell and all these guys, that's how much they've got as assets on their balance sheet. So if they don't use it, that's an asset they don't get to use, right? This is the problem. This is the problem. This is, the, this is what's creating the political problem. And I'm an economist, so I think there's always economics behind everything. And the political problem is created by the economic problem that exists. So those are the three numbers that we need to know. All right, and so in terms of actual warming, uh, have you watched, this is actually a real-time video. You can see it going from the beginning of recorded temperatures in the 1880s up to today. If you go to the NASA website, and it just kind of rolls, kind of rolls, and just takes about 25 seconds. It's, and it goes from basically all blue to all red, okay? Red is warm, <laughs> blue, is, blue is cold. 
So we really are having very significant um, actual uh, warming. So, and I think that Larry will talk more about this for our region here, but ironically, uh, what happens is cold places can get colder, warm places can get even really, really hotter, and dry places get drier, and wet places get wetter, so with, with climate change. So this is just some images surrounding this idea of more drought in some places and rising waters in others. So that's Business Week saying this entire country is about to be wiped out by climate change. It won't be the last. That's Kiribati, an island nation. And those are, that's an image on the top from there. And anybody know what this is? No? Before that? Katrina. Katrina. Yeah. And in fact, I, I, right before I came here today, I deleted one of the images because I thought it was disrespectful. But I wanted to make the point that this is life-threatening. This stuff kills people. And it was a dead body in Katrina floating, stuck on a, stuck on a, a reed in the river, like a plastic bag gets stuck, you know, like trash. And it just is like, this is, we're treating human beings like trash, essentially, when we're ignoring these signs. So there's a lot of very, a lot of other things going on. Biodiversity, acidification of the oceans, it goes on and on, right? So we're focusing on, on climate justice today. And what I wanted to do was talk about where the justice angle comes into this, okay? Those rising waters, those increasing droughts, those affect the poorest people the most, right? And the richest people the least, the people who have the resources to adapt, to move away, as opposed to those who didn't. We saw that in Katrina very clearly. If you didn't have a car to jump in and drive away in, you know, you might have died, as opposed to if you did. So. Um, when we talk about um, justice, I think Pope Francis's Laudato Si on care of the common earth is such a fabulous document. This is, there's so many fantastic quotes in it, they just go on and on. But this one he addresses St. Francis of Assisi and the canticle that he quotes from at the beginning of the encyclical as saying, St. Francis shows us just how inseparable the bond is between concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to society, and interior peace. So it takes it even a step further. It's not just even about social justice. It's like, what makes your life meaningful? What makes it worthwhile? What makes you a good human being? <laughs> you know? Okay? Um, so hopefully at Xavier and in all of our courses around sustainability, we, we really do touch on these things, and we really care about these themes. So just to, to wrap up here with what is climate justice? Yeah, we're starting with this theme, climate justice, what is it? Well, here's my shot at it. You can define it yourself too, but um, climate-related policies and practices that are ecologically sound as well as economically advantageous, and by that I mean really economically advantageous, not just short-term, but long-term, right? For all members of society, and not just including, but especially the least well-off, who are often the most affected by climate change. Okay, so um, what I would like to do now is to just let us go ahead and start addressing how we can help to achieve climate justice right here in Cincinnati, and even on Xavier's campus. And I uh, am uh, gratified that Dean David Mengel is here to kick us off. So I'll invite him to come on up. So, so welcome. Nancy Berteau asked me to welcome you, and I'm very happy to add my welcome to the one she's already offered. Um, I'm particularly pleased to be here again at Sustainability Day. Um, it was uh, another one of our professors, uh, Kathleen Smythe, who um, uh, really, without me knowing what I was getting into, roped me into the first Sustainability Day in 2009, and I've been coming back ever since. Um, I'm glad you're here, uh, and I'm glad to see so many students here. Let me tell you why I think what we're doing today with Sustainability Day, what we're doing in our academic programs related to sustainability, and this topic, climate justice, and our panelists are exactly what our university is about and should be doing. Um, Xavier, as you know, is a Jesuit Catholic university in Cincinnati, and I want to talk 
about its identity in three of those respects. As a university, we've been around since 1831. Um, as a Jesuit university, we, Jesuit university been around nearly 500 years. We are built to look at the long term. If we're not doing it, who is doing it? Um, so part, you're only here for four years, um, but you're going to be associated forever as you graduate with Xavier. So this is a part of your life. We have to be thinking your lifetime and beyond. So that's a part of who we are as a university. As a Jesuit Catholic university, we also have a mission focused on social justice, on meaning broadly understood, on helping you as students and, and we, um, everyone else here, to continually be asking deeper questions about who we are, what difference we make in the world, why we're here. Uh, we have been very intentional, I've been, and I've been very happy to support our faculty leaders in um, building academic programs that reflect this um, at all times, our care for the environment is a piece of that. Right now, with the Jesuit Pope, um, who is um, articulating this on a regular basis, it's even easier to think about the connection between social justice, care for the poor, and care for the earth. This is a part of who we are at Xavier. It's a part of who we are as a Jesuit Catholic university. Um, we're Jesuit Catholic. We're a university. We're in Cincinnati. And Although these are global issues that we care about, um, we are focused especially on what we can do beginning here, on our campus, in our community. It's why I'm so pleased to have so many members of our business, our government, our nonprofit community interested in sustainable issues, interested in care of the earth, to have engaged us and to continually engage us um, as advisors, as teachers, and today as panelists. So I'm thrilled you're here. I'm very excited to hear what our panelists have to say. And on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences, but on behalf of Xavier, our faculty and staff, uh, I want to welcome you all. So thank you. Thank you, David. OK, I'm going to introduce our panelists now so they can sort of come on up and take a seat, uh, any, any order. And I'm going to be turning over the, uh, the session to our moderator, Gabe Gottlieb, so I'll introduce him first. Uh, wonderful philosophy professor on campus and also director of ERS, the Ethics, Religion, and Society program that you all take as part of your core curriculum. And I think you'll see that our panelists show that Xavier is continuing its practice that David referred to of bringing academics and practitioners together. So I'll just uh, go down the line here, starting on uh, this end. We have Roxanne Qualls, the closest to uh, me. And as a city council member and mayor of Cincinnati and formerly community organizer for Ohio Citizen Action, Roxanne has worked to stop construction of the Fernald nuclear power plant, led the fight for passage of the city of Cincinnati's local air code, the establishment of the city of Cincinnati's recycling program, and successfully gained council approval of Cincinnati's residential gas and electric aggregation program, whereby she established as policy that the city would purchase 100% renewable energy for residences, and she's now our assistant to the provost for civic affairs. Okay, next is Larry Falcon. He is director of the City of Cincinnati's Office of Environment and Sustainability, where he leads the development and implementation of sustainability programs, ensures the city's compliance with environmental regulations, and oversees recycling services. Larry has a law degree and more than 25 years of experience as an environmental professional, including positions with the City of Kansas City, Missouri, and the US EPA. And he's really a recognized leader among city officials in charge of environmental issues nationwide. Uh, next, we have Scott Burns. Scott Burns retired last year from P&G, having led its solid waste reduction program, which reduced P&G's waste footprint by over 90%, with savings of over $2 billion. Did you get a 50% cut on that, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> 
Scott consults in support of industry waste reduction efforts and is currently working on a food waste reduction plan for the tri-state area, which will be presented at the Food Waste Forum at Xavier with James Buchanan here helping lead that effort on November 4th. So that's a great uh, uh, event for you all to attend. He was actually certified this summer as a global climate reality leader by Al Gore, and he's currently adjunct professor here at Xavier. And next we have Carmel. Carmel is a junior in the business sustainability major. It's called Sustainability Economics and Management. She's president of Xavier Student Sustainability and is a student research assistant to the ECOS and SUST academic programs. She's also an intern for Ohio Valley Food Connection, a local online farmer's market, and campus coordinator for Take Back the Tap, a water justice campaign. If you tasted the water earlier, and that's part of her efforts. She represented Xavier at a White House Forum for Sustainability Leaders this past summer. Next we have John. Okay. Uh, John Schulte is a mechanical engineer and executive director of physical plant at Xavier. He has had the opportunity in his career to work in the water, the automotive, medical, and aviation industries for Cincinnati Waterworks, Ford Motor Company, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and GE Aviation, respectively where his work has involved providing the most energy efficient and environmentally friendly solutions and facilities possible while also delivering economic returns. Uh, did I get everybody? Yeah, okay, very good. Okay, Gabe, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, great, thanks Nancy, uh, thanks David. Um, so uh, thank you, to, thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, we're gonna have a discussion about climate change and climate justice but I think part of the idea of, of uh, doing the uh, panel um, is to think about this in terms of Cincinnati and with a local perspective in, in some respects. And so what I'll do is I'll just start off with a question. And I'm going to start with Roxanne. Um, and I want to focus on, this, on the local dimension a little bit here. And the question that I have, and anyone else can jump in, is, is really this. Many people think that solutions to climate change uh, need to be addressed at the national level, that it needs to be addressed at the level of the nation state. Um, and it's not clear that we as a city or locally have much effect on what happens at the national level. There's a lot of skepticism about that. So I'm wondering if, if that's true, if that's right. Is, is this, does, this, does climate change need to be addressed at the level of the nation state? Is there room for something at the local level? Oh, sorry, make sure these mics are on. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So we'll start over. That was a very good question. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, when we look at local, locally actions that can be taken and look at local individuals, local individual actions only gets translated into any sort of public policy on a local level through political action. And since, as you heard in the introduction, I was a politician, I served as a city council member, I also was mayor, but before that I was a civic activist. And I specifically did environmental organizing. And what I learned is this, is that the phrase, which sometimes people might think is very trite, you know, think globally, act locally, is absolutely true. Climate change has to be addressed not just on a national level, but on a global level. However, what we know from looking at past environmental issues and the response of government to them in terms of policies is that it is local action and local government action that puts pressure on states and national governments to create national frameworks of legislation and regulation. We see already right now that whether it's Cincinnati as a community or the state of California or the state of Washington, you have different levels of local government that are acting. And eventually what will happen is that that will provide sufficient pressure for some form of national action. The only caveat to that is that when you actually look at what has become, um, in a sense, a, um, a caricature of political decision-making known as Congress, 
the actual hyper-partisanship that has, uh, has evolved around climate change specifically and the inability, therefore, of Congress to act is a big concern right now. And so local action um, is very effective, but it's for a long-term game plan. And um, Larry, you, I think, ha have an opportunity to speak specifically to what Cincinnati is doing locally. And I, I want to pick up on, so I want to hear a little bit about what Cincinnati is doing locally, but hearing what Roxanne said, she made the point that there's a way, there's a connection between the local and the national, and that the local, the city, is it able to put pressure on the national government and Congress? Or is there a connection there? So, I, so two parts then, what's happening locally, and how can Cincinnati and city government help put pressure on the national government? Great. And I think before I answer my question, I want to start by answering Roxanne's question. Because um, the question, how much difference do we make at the national level and how much difference do we make at the local level, has an actual measurable quantitative answer. Um, the city of Cincinnati has just finished completing a, an update of our greenhouse gas emissions inventory back in 2007. We adopted a Green Cincinnati plan focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions 2% per year. And so now after nine years, we did the measurement and discovered that we have reduced Cincinnati's greenhouse gas emissions, meaning everything that happens within the city boundaries of the city of Cincinnati, by 18.2%. We're just a smidgen ahead of our goal. And of that 18.2%, we're able to break it out by results of national level actions versus result of local actions. And actually about 10% of that is from national policies. We've got coal plants closing down, and those coal plants are closing down is decarbonizing our grid. Every watt of energy that you use has less carbon in it than it used to have. And so 10% of our reduction is because national policies are pushing coal out and pushing natural gas and renewables in. Um, and 8% of the accomplishments are from things that we have done here locally that have made a measurable difference in our greenhouse gas emissions, the biggest single item of which is the Electricity and Natural Gas Aggregation Program that Roxanne championed when she was on City Council. And so um, what we're doing locally makes a difference. What we're doing at the national level makes a difference. Roughly parity between how big those two slices are. So when I think about climate justice in Cincinnati, there's three questions that I ask myself and have to ask myself repeatedly to get to sort of the nut of the issue. Um, the first one is, what will climate change look like here in Cincinnati? The second one is, who will be impacted by those changes? And then the third one is, what do we do about it? And so when we think about what climate change looks like in Cincinnati, it's an important topic because most of what you hear in the national press is about coastal storms, that's not us, sea level rise, that's not us, uh, droughts, that's not us, wildfires, that's not us. And so it's easy for people in Cincinnati to not really viscerally relate to the discussion about climate change. What we know about climate change in Cincinnati is um, our climate is changing in significant ways that have big local impacts. So the first thing to talk about in terms of what climate change in Cincinnati is, is heat waves. More frequent and more intense heat waves. And of all the kinds of natural disasters, heat waves are the biggest killers. They don't get the most press, they don't cause a lot of economic damage, and so they're easy to overlook, but heat waves are the biggest killers. So who is impacted in Cincinnati by intensifying heat waves? We have heat fatalities in Cincinnati every summer. And how hot the summer is largely impacts how many of those fatalities we have. So think about who in our community lives without air conditioning. Because there are a lot of people in Cincinnati who don't have air conditioning. 
people who um, live in neighborhoods where they will not open their windows because they're afraid that that's an invitation to crime. And so people live in unair conditioned spaces with the windows closed throughout a hot summer because the neighborhood they're in puts them in that kind of fear. And then people who have limited mobility, whether it's age or health conditions or economic conditions, we may open up cooling shelters, but not everybody can get to them. And so what do we do about it? You know, Cincinnati is just on the very leading edge of figuring out what climate change looks like for us and how we get ready. So it's easy to throw out ideas that are not yet implemented. That's about the stage that we're at. We're brainstorming the ideas and starting to figure out how to implement them. So cooling shelters, you know, we always have warming shelters on the coldest winter nights, but we're not very good at cooling shelters on the hottest summer days. Um, caring networks, who are the most vulnerable people in our population and how do we get contact information for them so we can just check in on a regular basis with those especially vulnerable people, call them up and say, hey, how are you doing? Do you need some help? Um, and then you can even take a building code approach to the problem, right? Um, we have laws that say if you rent an apartment, it's got to have a heating system, and that heating system has to be able to maintain 68 degrees. Why don't we have a similar building code that says if you rent the apartment, at least one room needs a cooling system and needs to be able to get so that room down to... One, one question I have, degrees. though, mm -hmm. I'm just to, I want to actually go back to Roxanne on this, is someone who uh, has worked in city government both at the, at the level of the mayor but also at the level of city council, how do some of those, how do we address some of those issues? What, do, how do, what needs to happen politically in Cincinnati? Well, the good news is that local government tends to be the most responsive level of government, even though that's probably for those of you who've taken any political science courses, you heard that over and over again. And it's true. And that's because you can actually call up and you can go down and you can meet with a member of city council, or if not all of them, most of them, or you can meet with their aides. You also can belong to organizations that actually are very strong advocates for specific policy changes, um, some of which Larry was talking about, and um, organize politically um, to advocate for those changes. Um, one of the things which I think is something that's very encouraging if you want to make a difference uh, on a local level is that there are avenues to do that. There, the system tends to be responsive, but the one caveat I would have to that is um, that, that particularly now, given the critical state we're in with climate change, that it is important that people be willing to organize and take organized political action in the form of specific pressures on their government officials to make the policy changes. And locally, um, it can happen. Okay. Great. So um, I want to go to you, Scott, and maybe you can say something about um, P&G, Procter & Gamble. You experience uh, 30 years with them. Is that right? Yep. And um, so another local component to think about is the corporations, right, uh, in business. And I really do wonder what can P&G – so P&G can do something within its uh, internal organization and the products it makes and, and uh, promote more sound uh, and environmentally safe and products. But can P&G do something in terms of – the politics or the communities within Cincinnati, and is, has it been doing that? Or is it more geared toward its own sort of uh, uh, product line and internally? So I guess I'm wondering about the internal versus the external nature and how a company like P&G can deal with that. So it's, it's a very broad component. We have local responsibilities and activities that we take on board, and so from things like disaster relief. So as people are impacted by things like the flooding in, on the southeast uh, or Katrina, whatever, we have response that we do, whether it be sending in uh, Duracell trucks or Tide Loads of Hope. Uh, we're partners with Matthew 25 Ministries over in Blue Ash, and so 
we help support them to be able to get there right away to help people out when they're in that kind of turmoil. Uh, and we fund also a range of things internationally as well to help support when things happen. Mm -hmm. um, we also try to set a good you know, standard by leading in regard to sustainability work. So our zero waste work was a, men, a means of doing that. Uh, in Paris, I mean, it was a, a big part of Paris was companies coming forward and saying what they were willing to do. Uh, so the countries got there, but the companies was as a big a portion of that. Um, you saw Paul Pullman from Unilever in the front row. Unilever's doing some really cool things. So Procter's doing a lot of good things, but so is Unilever. All the various companies are stepping forward and dr helping drive this because they know they've got to get there. If we don't do something, our consumers are affected, and we, we've got to step forward. So what does it take, though, to get a large corporation like P&G on board with climate justice, and what do you have to do? How do, how do they get on board with this? It doesn't necessarily seem like it's always in their interest. Part of the problem is too often the conversation is, this is what it's going to cost you. And so it's always a painful story to tell, which is, you know, hey, Gabe, you, we can do this for you. We can drive some climate change, but it's going to cost you $30 million or $10 or whatever it might be. We, you can go into solar panels, et cetera, but it's always going to cost you money. The key that we tried to figure out was how to save some money at this and make it more economically viable, because now it's a matter of the conversation is we can do the right thing and we can save money at it. And it's by driving both those things. The cost of solar panels and wind turbines and all that are coming down dramatically. In a lot of, a lot of part of the country, they're at parity right now. And that's with coal and natural gas being at all-time record lows in pricing. And so part of it is just having the right conversation, but finding a way to make sense of it financially. And then companies, shockingly, will get after it very, very quickly. Great. Uh, so we're talking at levels of scale, and uh, we've said something about nationally, uh, city. We've talked about corporations a little bit. But we're all here at a university, on part of, part of a university. And my first question about the university, and I'll direct this to you, Carmel, is what is, and, and, and John, you can follow up too, um, but is Xavier being affected by climate change? Is this something that uh, is affecting our university in any way? Um, well, absolutely. Um, for most of the people here, I, I can probably assume that you have lived in Cincinnati and have been here over the last month. Um, there was serious flooding in Norwood uh, a couple weeks ago, and thousands of homes, thousands of families have been affected by that. Even Xavier was affected by that. Um, and flooding isn't really an issue that you think of here in Cincinnati. I don't know if it's ever actually happened to that scale in recent memory. Um, I know students, you can look, go into the lower parts of the CLC or go into Smith. They have ripped out entire portions of the building because there was so much water damage. So much water came into the building. So for people saying that Cincinnati is not affected and that Xavier is not affected by climate change is simply a lie. Um, and I have heard that before. I've heard students say, you know, well, yes, climate change is happening in certain parts of the world, but Cincinnati, eh, not so much. You know, we, we don't get the, the droughts and the, the wildfires and the sea rise. Um, but there's also a lot that, that we can be doing to help prevent that as well. Great. So, uh, but what about, um, and what is your I can add yeah, to that yeah. too. When you talk about climate change and here locally, uh, in 2008 we were hit with a hurricane. We've never been hit by a hurricane in Cincinnati in the past. You know, so uh, it came all the way up from Louisiana to here, and we still had sustained winds of 75 to 80 miles an hour. So you can't say we're not impacted. Some people just don't realize it because you don't see the rain and everything else, but it truly was still a hurricane when it hit Cincinnati. So it's happening, and even with this rain, to get five inches or six inches of rain in a matter of a couple hours, uh, that's like a once in 500 year event. So, I mean, it's just not a common thing to happen here. We had five feet of water sitting on Dana Avenue and Dana Avenue's at the top of the hill. I mean, that's scary when you think about that. You know, and the systems here, uh, another example of that, with all that rain coming, we blew a a uh, 12-foot diameter stormwater drain, com combined sewer drain, we blew an 8 by 20-foot section out of it right down by the tennis courts and flooded that whole area completely. So uh, 
those are the things that are happening that we haven't seen in the past. So the impacts are here. It's just a lot of people like to deny it, but it is here. But what can, what can Xavier do to further commitments uh, on sustainability and what, what can we do? Here on campus, we, the altar building was built at Elite Silver. And to give you an example of what kind of improvement we're seeing from just that building, and now we're looking at the new one to be possibly a gold. But when you take Smith, which is not very old, maybe six years old, compared to Alter, which opened last year, the BTU per square foot is half. That's a big change. So you, I, I don't even want to say what it would be compared to, you know, uh, an Edge Cliff or the other ones, but you know we're going to make those better. But that's just in that short period of time. Those are the kind of gains we can make. So I mean, it is something that's achievable. You can get there. I mean, you're talking a period of five years, we reduced something by half that was already way more efficient than anything else that was here. What, and so I, I just follow that up with a question for you, Carmel. Um, from a student's perspective, what, how do, can students get involved on these issues here at Xavier? What can students do? Well, first, um, for anybody who doesn't know, we, have, we do have Student Sustainability, which um, was formerly known as Sustainability Club. That is a thing. Um, there's lots of volunteer opportunities to get involved with local organizations who are doing a lot of good on campus or around campus. Um, students um, in specific, I, I know that millennials and Generation Z, we're always on our phones. Um, and I, I think something that I've seen in the last year, especially here on campus and being a student and being so involved with um, student organizations is the power of social media um, and the power that pressuring those who have, who have the power to make big changes such as Father Graham, having a movement of students to, to pressure Father Graham or the sustainability program or really anybody um, with, with those power to make the changes of whether that is going no waste on campus um, or making sure that we have a 75 percent recycling rate or people who can really make sure that these policies are being implemented on campus. Um, you know, we also talk about solar panels and renewable energy on campus. How great would it be if students, if a thousand students tweeted at Father Graham to put solar panels on campus. <laughs> that's 25% of the school. Yeah. 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 I yeah. mean, that's incredible. Right. And the power, the, the ease yeah. that social media has created within our generation to get things done and make action Great. happen. So Scott, you were, you were involved in a project uh, over the summer, um, the uh, Climate Reality Project. And, can you tell us about that? Because it sounds like another opportunity for folks and students even to get involved. Yeah, it was a really great opportunity. I just signed up on the web. I was searching for different opportunities out there. It's called Global Climate Reality Leadership Corps. It's, a non, it's out of a nonprofit that Al Gore put together back when he started Inconvenient Truth 10 years ago. And they have educated about 10,000 adults. And there were some young people, really young people there as well. But it's a lot of college students were there. It is a free three-day training course. Uh, you pay your expenses to fly down and to a hotel or whatever, and they'll even work things to help make that lower down. There's scholarships available. Uh, but Al does about four hours with us during that period of time. We had training in social justice, et cetera. It was a tremendous program. I highly recommend it. Uh, and it really educates you. And then the, the give back is you have to do 10 to 20 activities in support of climate change whether writing letters or doing speeches or whatever, but that's the contract that you have with their organization is they're training you. And the reason they did this is because instead of going after politicians at the highest levels, they said, if we can put 10,000 people out there who really understand climate change and they start to talk to a bunch of different people, we can start to make a movement in there overall. And the number of people that I talk to every day, they go, this isn't real, is it this climate change thing? And a 15 minute conversation can really change somebody's understanding. And then you show them some different things uh, we had a bunch of folks here the other night to watch Leo DiCaprio's movie uh, Before the Flood, which opens, I think, this Sunday night on National Geographic. It's open on Netflix, etc. It's streaming, so there's no excuse not to be able to watch it. They're making it very, very available. 
Yeah. It is free. So get out there and, and, and take a look at it. It's a tremendous film. It shows you on-site activities are going on from tar sands to floods, etc. But there's one thing that students can do to make a difference, and that's two weeks from now. Get out and vote. Don't vote for somebody who doesn't believe in climate change. It's not trying to drive a difference. And there's a lot of folks out there that are running for office that are in the climate denial mode. Uh, your vote is the biggest thing you can do to make a difference very quickly. All right. Well, we still have some time for questions for the audience. So um, I want to open it up. And yeah. And I, is there a mic there's somewhere? I'm not sure. Well, the most effective form of um, environmental activism was actually when I was an activist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Giving away your secrets. Um, and what I'd like to say is that one of the most concerning um, things that I've ex I experienced was when I was on Cincinnati City Council is even among environmental organizations their inability and unwillingness anymore to organize and to actually engage in conflict. Wait, this is Cincinnati, so you can be polite and disagree with people. You can be in conflict and still not be screaming obscenities at people. You know, so when I say engage in conflict, change is conflict. You are challenging interests. Not everybody's going to agree with you, but what you have to have in, in, in general when it comes to any issue, but specifically when you're looking at environmental issues and climate change, you know, if you're as an individual who is working with other people in organization, you have to be willing to uh, systematically understand the issue, organize other people, form alliances, develop coalitions, and be prepared in the initial stages to be in conflict. And that's how change comes about. Um, and you also have to hold to account those people who say they want to represent your interests. Um, no one's going to be perfect. I was not perfect when I was an elected official. But, but whether it's at a local level, a state level, or a national level, if we're concerned about climate change, then we need to hear people actually talk knowledgeably about it who say they want our vote. Uh, just first a comment and then, then a question for John. The first, com uh, first comment is that one of the things that Xavier desperately needs now is a sustainability director to replace yes. Anne And it's not just that we need a sustainability director. She was misplaced as she was placed because she was only in physical plant. We need somebody who has a foot in physical plant and in the academic side. And what we really need, if we, if we really believe diversity and inclusion is worthy of somebody advising the president, then we need somebody in sustainability at that level in the university. That'd be, that's a huge statement by the university. If you guys want to put pressure on the president about that, there's something you can do. And there's a movement that, that students can really push on. She's not been replaced. They interviewed us uh, almost seven, eight months ago about this, mm -hmm. and then nothing has happened. Question for John. The biggest building on campus is CentOS. CentOS is now going through a major renovation. A lot of money, millions of dollars, is going into that. How much of that is being put into sustainable technologies? That is a question I really can't answer because I was not involved in the scoping of that building yet since I'm new here. So I will have to find out and ask, but I don't think there's... <laughs> Any, that's it. It's basically uh, niceties for the fans and the people coming to the to the arena, but not anything for making it more so, climate so the friendly. We need to ask as a community why 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 do we put millions of dollars into that and none of it go into this professed value that we hold of sustainability in our largest. And, and I know a and lot that of us comes to where the activist part 
needs right. to start because everything, almost anywhere, is driven by economics. And when all the parties are involved with what they want, they tend to want the things that make the customers happy and bring in more money and don't look a lot of times at the long, the longevity of the facility and what it can eventually save and what it can bring to the table. And so that makes it tough because I, I hate to say it, we are in a society of instant gratification and instant return and people don't want to wait for that. And really with the numbers that were just put up here on the board, how long can we afford to wait? We really can't. I can add an editorial comment. I can't resist. So a lot of us are really would love to see, for example, a solar roof on Sintas. I mean, that is a hallmark building. People come from all over. And frankly, they come for a lot of sustainability programming at Sintas. We've, brought, we've held a number of very important events in the area. And we would love to be the greenest conference center in the region. And I think that would be one of those examples, Scott and, and, and uh, John, of marrying the economic payoff with the sustainability initiative. But that's I can't tell you one, one thing we are doing to operationally uh, make it more climate friendly. We are getting ready to do a complete change out to LEDs in the entire center. That's huge. Center. Yeah. That's so we're huge. in the process of doing that right now. Very good. Yeah. Thanks. James, just, next week. Just to follow on that, James, is with the mindset that currently exists, which is that sustainability has to cost more, it drives a behavior of let's not do something. As we change that mindset to sustainability should save us money and make it easier to do things, right. then the question will always be asked, why haven't we done it? Because we know it saves money. We've got to change that dichotomy and, around. Uh, University of Dayton. We were talking about having, I can't think of his name, uh, come down. Uh, Charlie. Mr. Hanley. Mr. Hanley. Yes, he came and helped present to UD and get the process started there on how the financial return can pay off to do this. And so we were talking about possibly seeing if we could get uh, him to come down and maybe speak with us and maybe to Father Graham and some of the people that have the control to help push that. If we can have somebody that can truly show where it's been successful and showing a return, we might be able to get that to move forward quicker here. That's actually a great segue, John, into what I was going to ask. My name is Alana. I was born and raised in Cincinnati. I've been away for 11 years, and now I'm back. Um, I have a question for you, Carmel. Um, the question is, and it's kind of also picking up what you had said, Roxanne, was that um, it's about collaborating and working with all the different agencies that are that do have the same mission, that do have the same goal in the end. So my question is, how much are, is the student activist center here, the sustainability, the savior sustainability, how much are you working with other universities or even high schools in Cincinnati? And is there any collaboration or opportunities that can be had there? I mean, you just said, John, that you're working with UD. How can getting, you collaborate? We're, we're wanting to. We haven't started yet, but wanting we're going to go there. We're going to try. You'll get there. It'll we're work. We're going to try. Um, I can tell you from Xavier Student Sustainability, um, right now we don't have any collaboration with any other universities or high schools. I would really love to work with University of Cincinnati. They have an incredible sustainability program over there. They have solar panels on campus. They have successfully implemented sustainable policies on their campus through student activism. And I think one of the challenges that we're facing right now is simply the amount of students that we attract. Um, the, the program here is still relatively small, and if you have business students or nursing students, then they're going to join the extracurriculars that are most relevant to their majors. So if we only have 50 or 60 total sustainability eco -sust land majors, um, you know, we have a, a weekly or bi-monthly bi um, meeting student rate of maybe 12 or 15 students. And while that might be a lot to go help or volunteer or do a Habitat for Humanity, it's not a lot to organize on campus. And um, I think growing the academic programs on campus is, is really going to be instrumental to growing student sustainability as a whole um, and helping us 
to just get more students. Um, it's even more of a reason to partner. Absolutely. Um, hi, my name is Leah. I just graduated from Xavier in May, and now I work for um, a socially responsible investment firm here in town. Um, can anyone on the panel speak to um, particularly like what Xavier's um, like board of trustees or how their um, finances are maybe controlled or organized and who would be the best way to open a conversation with divestment or other ESG investments? Well, our top person when it comes to finances would be Beth Amiot. She is our chief financial officer and executive vice president of financial, administ of financial administration. So that that would be going to the, the only level you can go higher would be to Father Graham. What's her name? Beth Amiot, A-M-Y-O-T. But isn't there also a student business club that does its own investments? And if anybody here... The, the several people, uh, not, yeah, the, um, the finance majors have a, a, <laughs> um, an, a role in investing for Xavier in the D'Artagnan Club, am I saying that right? Um, is anybody in that here, the group? But I know that there have been several students who have been active on that and we're trying to kind of leverage a little bit more activity from them. And there is also an investments person. We use a firm, I think, for our investments, but we do have one full-time investment person in um, Beth Amiot's division who has met with us and is, is, is sympathetic to some of the goals. But we could do a whole lot more in that arena. Okay, thank you so much, guys. I want uh, uh, Dean Mengel to get a chance to say a couple of words to wrap us up. So we're not used to talking about justice. Thank you for bringing this when we talk about climate. Um, when we say that Xavier is committed to social justice and that has implication for the earth, you've heard today that doesn't mean we always live up to our ideals. Um, it's dreadfully important that we remind each other of those ideals in the ways that you've talked about. When we're talking about standing up for justice for the earth, for justice for the poor, um, let, let you hear me today say it's dreadfully important that we stand up for racial justice and against racial discrimination. Um, all kinds of discrimination, today let listen and hear me, it is not okay when there is racial discrimination on our campus. Our community will not and cannot let that go. Um, so please, as you think of the earth, um, let us hold one another to our ideals today and going forward. Thank you. Can we please give another round of applause to our wonderful panelists? Thank you so much. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you all for coming. And I know Carmel, isn't there a bat, a speaker on the wonderful bat? Yeah, who's coming? Thursday at 5 p.m., Nicole Gunderman, a um, local bat expert from Gorman Heritage Farm, will be speaking and giving a presentation about the importance of bats to our ecosystem as another Sustainability Week event here at 5 p.m. on Thursday. At Kennedy, 5 p.m. Yes. on Thursday. Okay, thanks again, everyone.